Good morning, everyone. Today is Wednesday, December 9th, 2009. This is the 343rd day of 2009. There are 22 days left in this year. On this day in history, December 9th, 1992, Britain's Prince Charles and Princess Diana announced their separation. On this day in 1608, poet John Milton was born in London. In 1907, Christmas seals went on sale for the first time at the Wilmington, Delaware Post Office. The proceeds went to fight tuberculosis. In 1940, British troops opened their first major offensive in North Africa during World War II. In 1941, China declared war on Japan, Germany, and Italy. And in 1958, the anti-communist John Birch Society was formed in Indianapolis. And those are some of the events that have taken place on this day in history. The weather for today, snow and widespread blowing snow. The snow could be heavy at times, temperatures falling to around 21 degrees by 5 p.m. North-northwest wind between 22 and 24 miles per hour with gusts as high as 36 miles per hour. Chance of precipitation is 100 percent. Total daytime snow accumulation of around 3 inches. Tonight, a chance of snow showers before 6 p.m., then areas of blowing snow and a chance of snow before midnight, then a chance of flurries after midnight. Cloudy with a low around 2. And then tomorrow, Thursday, partly sunny and cold with a high near 6. Currently in Wassa, it is uh, snowy and blowing and 26 degrees at 8.59. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Wednesday edition of Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret, and we are here to study the Word of God today. After a day off, I'm just glad I was able to make it to the station this morning. I didn't know if my little two-wheel drive pickup truck was going to be able to handle the, the hills that I have to come up, but fortunately, the hills were plowed, and uh, I am here, and we're ready to study the Word of God together, 2 Corinthians we begin our study in chapter 10 this morning, verse 1. But first, the views and the opinions of this program are solely the views of myself and may not be the same as that of our management group, the Friends of WNRBLP, or our owners, the Wassa Area Hmong Mutual Association. And so we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. We'll see how far we get. I'm going to pray and ask for God's blessing on our time together. Lord, I ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid, when face to face with you, but bold when away. Now, he's not saying that that's the way he is, but he is repeating a line that the false teachers um, said about him in an attempt to uh, discredit him uh, before the Corinthians. You know, he started that church, and and they really appreciated him. And then he went away, and the false teachers came in and tried to undermine his ministry. And one of the things he said was well, he was just all talk. You know, he can talk big when he's not here, that Apostle Paul, but he's just, you know, a wimp when he gets gets in front of you face to face. Well, you know, the fact is serving Christ ought to be done because it's the correct thing to do. And it ought to flow out of a heart for God. And the word of God, like the Apostle Paul here, appeals to Christians in a gentle way to live for Jesus. It's not about you know, some preacher or some pastor thinking that he's got all sorts of authority and, you know, throws down the hammer and 
demands this and demands that. That's a bunch of baloney. You know, give out the truth and let Christians serve God voluntarily if that's what they want to do, because that's the only thing that that's the only kind of service that God is interested in, to be honest with you. And so he says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. So, you know, on the one hand, you know, a teacher, including the Apostle Paul of God's Word, will appeal to Christians with the Word of God to do what is right. But on the other hand, false teachers who would lead Christians astray need to be put in their place and need to be put in their place quickly. And there's no room for tolerance when it comes to them. Verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The Apostle Paul did not fight spiritual battle with his fists. And Christians ought not fight spiritual battles with guns or swords or bombs or anything else. You know, every once in a while you hear of somebody, some wild-eyed Christian nut bombing a, an abortion clinic. Well, that's just about as unbiblical as anything can be. You know, sure, if you're a Christian you're, and you're following Scripture, you know that abortion is not right. But to bomb a studio or a, a, a clinic is ridiculous. And, you know, question their walk with the Lord to begin with. Verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So spiritual warfare is conducted by proclaiming the word of God. You know, when, when we rightly divide scripture, we demolish every false idea or teaching which wars against the souls of men and seeks to destroy those souls in hell. That's how spiritual warfare should be conducted, by communicating the Word of God. And, and if people are open to accepting the Word of God, well, then they do. And they, then they change their lives uh, as is needed and conform them to the Word of God. And that's how the kingdom of God advances. And if people don't want to, well, then they don't. And it's just as simple as that. But you don't try to force something on anyone who doesn't want it. I mean, I, I expect a, a lot of you maybe who are listening do not agree with some of the things that I say. And that's fine. That's up to you. You know, I'm just communicating the Holy Scriptures verse by verse the best that I can. Verse 6. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. In other words, what he's saying is that when people are given the time allotted by God to repent, then those who don't repent are going to be punished. You know, that eventually has to come, that time, because God is a, ju a God of justice, and he is holy. Verse 7, you are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much, much as he. In other words, if you're looking for someone who belongs to Christ, Paul says, and who is, who is clearly living for Jesus, then don't look at those false teachers. Now, they may look good outwardly, but look at me and look at what I put up with for the sake of the Word of God and Jesus Christ. And he's not complaining, but he is defending his integrity. Verse 8, For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. He's saying, I speak with authority in spiritual matters because Jesus gave me that authority and I'm not backing down one bit. And no preacher of God's word should. And someone says, well, Paul was a power-hungry maniac speaking with authority like this, actually making value judgments. No, not really. He spoke with authority because he spoke the word of God. So he spoke with authority concerning the Holy Bible, but it was all for the purpose of helping other Christians in their walk with the Lord and proclaiming truth 
that God says is truth. So, of course, you're going to speak it with authority. Nothing worse to me than a preacher who teaches something in Scripture and then backtracks and apologizes for what he believes. You know, it's just sickening to me. I would, I have more respect for somebody who I disagree with on every issue, but at least they have enough courage to proclaim what they believe. You know, to me, to me, that deserves more respect than a preacher or a Christian who says what the Bible says and then apologizes for it because they don't want to be thought of as, you know, uncool in the eyes of the world. That's just sickening. And the Apostle Paul spoke the word of God with authority, and that's the way it ought to be. Verse 9, I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. And he's not trying to push anyone around or intimidate anyone. But the word of God is the word of God, you know. And it must be spoken with authority. Even if it rubs some people the wrong way, it's still the word of God. And if the word of God is not spoken with authority, then that misrepresents the God who gave it. Because he is the authority. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Verse 10. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. He, Paul was not a big, tall, good-looking fella. And he was not eloquent. But he did speak the word of God. Paul's authority did not stem from him being eloquent or from him yelling. He didn't do either of those things. He spoke with authority because he spoke the word of God. And whether people chose to believe it or not, it's truth. Ten. Actually, verse 11. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. In other words, we're still going to speak with authority. You know, he wrote with authority because what he wrote was inspired by God. It is the word of God. And when he's present, he's going to act with authority. He's going to speak with authority in person, too, if what he speaks is the word of God, of course. So what he's saying is he taught the word of God, he lived the word of God, and he will enforce the word of God toward those who corrupt it or contradict it. How is he going to enforce it? By communicating it clearly and doing what it says? And if somebody is contradicting the Word of God and they claim to be a teacher, he will remove them from the fellowship because that's what the Bible says needs to be done. You know, a preacher has to teach God's Word straight or it doesn't do anybody any good. And he has to declare it to those who reject it and corrupt it too. Not to get them, but in the hopes that the Word of God will wake them up because it's their soul that's at stake and the soul of the people that they are misleading. You know, because in the end, the word of God is going to stand and all who oppose it will fall. Verse 12, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. They are not wise. Measuring our level of righteousness to someone else's level of righteousness, you know, that is a complete waste of time because God does not grade on the curve. Big deal. If I'm a little better than someone else, I'm not saying I am. In my own mind, I'm not. But let's hypothetically, I'm better than my neighbor. Big deal. So what? That's like lung cancer saying, well, I guess I'm not too bad. After all, I'm better than the bat black plague. It doesn't mean anything. Jesus is the standard, not my neighbor, not me. 13. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you. 
The only thing worth boasting about is what Jesus is able to accomplish through us. Christians are to boast in Christ, never boast in self. Verse 14. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. It is sufficient to boast about what God has done through us. That's good enough. Christians who are walking with the Lord, Christians who are close to the Lord Jesus Christ, as they should be, will not make things up about themselves to come across looking better than they really are. They won't do that if they understand that it's not about them anyway. It's all about God working in, in and through them, and therefore he should be the focus at all times. 15. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that, as your faith continues to grow, our area of activity among you will greatly increase, so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. He was always looking to expand the word of God as far as communicating it to more and more people who had not heard it. And you know, there should be a ripple effect in God's work, like the rings and the ripples that expand from a pebble being dropped into a lake. The blessings that we have received from the Word of God, the blessings that we have received from other Christians, should be passed on by us to other people. And that's how the Word of God expands, and that's how the ministry of Jesus Christ can touch more and more people and help them. The last part of verse 16, For we do not want to boast about work already done in another man's territory. Christians, more than anyone, should never try to take credit for something <clears throat> excuse me, that someone else has done. You know, In a way, that's kind of like stealing, isn't it? Verse 17, But let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. There it is. This is the most important thing right here. We, as Christians, should not talk about what we have done or how great we are or how much we have given. You know? We should always give credit, all credit, to the Lord God. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If we do something well, it's because of God. If we do something right, it's because of God. If we do something wrong, it's because of us. 18. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. You know, so we can talk as Christians about how great we are, but that doesn't make us great. It's not going to influence how God sees us, and he has the final say. And we, we can talk about how great we are, and that may make us feel good, but I'll tell you what, to a spiritual person, it makes us look bad. And so Christians should spend their energy trying to live for God, trying to do the right thing in the eyes of God, rather than talking about how good they think they are. Before we get into chapter 11, I think we'll take our short break here. And uh, please listen to this. I'll be back in one minute. You are listening to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. By the way, are you sending Christmas cards this year, or are you making the most of technology and sending greetings via email? No matter how the greetings are shared, it's nice to hear from family and friends. It's a helpful way to catch up on children, grandchildren, new jobs, new locations, and a host of other things happening in the lives of those who send us their greetings. For many of us, the most important point of sending and receiving greetings is for the sender and the receiver to be reminded and to rejoice together in the remembrance of the birth of a Savior, Jesus Christ. May He be part of your greetings this Christmas, no matter what form they take. This is By the Way. And with blowing snow, it's 25 degrees in Wausau at 917. Welcome back to 
Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret, and uh, we are currently study, sec, studying 2 Corinthians, and we resume our study now in chapter 11, verse 1, which reads, I hope you will put up with a little of my foolishness, but you are already doing that. I bet you never thought that you would read something like that in the Bible, where a writer of the Bible says, I hope you will put up with some of my foolishness. But you know what he's doing? He's going to use something foolish to teach a spiritual truth. You know, there are all different types of literature in the Bible. And uh, and, it, and it's important to take every scripture in context so that you know what kind of literature you're dealing with so that you can rightly understand what is being said. And so, you know, he's going to he, he's saying he's going to talk foolish. And what he's going to say is foolish, but again, he's going to use it to make a point, and God inspired it. Verse 2, I don't know that this is foolish right here. He says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. God wants us to be pure for Jesus. He's talking about spiritual purity. You know, the Bible teaches that Christians are the bride of Christ. And just like a wife should be totally dedicated to her husband, and he should be totally dedicated to her, Jesus is totally dedicated to us, and we should be totally dedicated to him. And, you know, something else. Christians should be jealous on behalf of Christ. In other words, we should want every Christian to be completely devoted to Jesus and we should feel bad when that's not the case. Verse 3. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Eve was deceived. Go back and read the second chapter of Genesis sometime. Uh, actually, and the third chapter. And just see how Eve was deceived away from her pure devotion to God by the devil. You know, he used fine-sounding words. He appealed to her sense of pride and to her flesh, and she took the bait. And she was deceived away from her devotion to God by the cunning ways of Satan. You know, the, the devil is real, and he still works hard. And he's got a lot of helpers. Is demons. He's got multitudes of demons. And uh, they use multitude of ways to deceive Christians away from the pure biblical devotion to God today, too. He's, you know, he still does it. Nothing has changed. Verse 4. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you received a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel, from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. You say, there's another Jesus? No. There's only one Son of God, Savior, Lord of Lord, and King of Kings, Jesus, the Son of the Father. There's only one genuine Jesus. But whenever any preacher or teacher says something or teaches something that is contrary to what the Scripture says about Jesus, they are preaching another Jesus, one that they have made up. And that's what was happening in this church. The false teachers were preaching another Jesus. They had made things up about Christ that simply were not true and were not biblical, and the people were accepting it. Well, then they were following a false Christ. You see how that happens? And they were putting up with it. Anyone who misrepresents the Lord Jesus Christ by teaching things about him that are contrary to Scripture, is proclaiming another Jesus. And anybody who follows those teachings, those teachings are serving another Christ. They may not realize it, but that's reality. Verse 5. But I do not think I am the least inferior to those super apostles. You know, generally speaking, and he's not calling them super apostles, Himself, Paul isn't saying that that's what they were, but that's what they proclaimed to be. Generally speaking, 
the false teachers, whether it was back then or today, who proclaim a different Christ or a different message other than what is in Scripture, will try to sell it by saying that they are superior men or superior women of God who are endowed with greater spiritual insight. And that's one of the ways they get people to buy into them and to their false teachings. Six, he says, I may not be a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. And we have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. It is more important for a preacher or a Christian in general to speak truth than it is to be witty or eloquent. Simple, sincere, honest truth is something that the Holy Spirit uses. The other things can actually be distracting and therefore stifle the work of the Holy Spirit. Seven, was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? He says, was that wrong of me to preach the gospel to you and not demand an offering? You know why I said this? is because some Christians um, back in Corinth, along with these false teachers, were thinking in accord with their sin nature instead of in accord with the Holy Spirit. And they were thinking that any preacher, including the Apostle Paul, who doesn't press for an offering, doesn't deserve an offering, or maybe doesn't think that they deserve an offering. That's why they don't ask for it. Totally wrong. The fact is any preacher who is willing to preach and teach the word of God for free is giving evidence that he's a man of God, truly called by God to proclaim the word of God. Verse 8. He says, I've robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. Now, this doesn't mean that Paul embezzled offerings from other churches. It means that he was living off the kind offerings of some while he was ministering the word of God to others who either could not or would not give. Verse 9. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. So the Apostle Paul was devoted to Jesus, and as a result, he was devoted to serving other Christians as opposed to some who teach the Bible and use it to draw attention to themselves or get something for themselves. Verse 10, As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. God knows. He certainly does. God knows why a preacher preaches. And it better be for the love of Christ and the love of the people, not for love of self. Verse 12. And I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. If a preacher or a Christian in general, has to be more spiritual and more sacrificial than they already are in order to advance the cause of Christ, well, then that's the way they should be. And that's the way Paul was. And he sets a good example for us. If you have any questions or comments for me, you can write me at Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, WASA, 54402-2211. If you would rather email me, you can email me at vbyvmm at aol.com. That's vbyvmm at aol.com. If you want more of the Word of God, you can go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website. You can study the entire Bible online for free with my audio Bible commentaries and that website can be found at meret.org. That's meret, M-E-U-R-E-T-T dot O-R-G. And it's Christmas season. So if you wanted to listen and watch some really nice Christmas videos, go to my website. Go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website on the home page. Click on Carol's Christmas videos. And I believe it will bless you.
Again, that address is Meret, M-E-U-R-E-T-T dot O-R-G. If you need some place to worship, you're welcome to join us on Sunday mornings. We meet at Island Place, which is right next to Oak Island here in Wausau. We meet at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. That's 10 o'clock Sunday morning, Island Place, right next to Oak Island. Service lasts about 50 minutes, and you're welcome to join us. It's Christ-centered, Christ-focused, and you'll get the Word of God verse by verse. I'm with you Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Until tomorrow, this is Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.